This is Monsieur, and welcome to Crypto and Grill. Let's Crypto and Grill. Hey everybody, it's Crypto Dantes here and I'm with Stig of the Pump. Stig, say hello. Hello, hello. How is everyone? I shouldn't ask how everyone is because it's just me and you and our guest. <laughs> exactly. I'm, do you know what? And it's a guest I'm super excited about. Um, so you don't even need to ask me how I am. Um, it's someone who uh, we have been really looking forward to uh, to getting on recently. Um, it's about sort of six weeks ago, I think, that we started talking uh, and planning the session. And um, uh, I want to hear the uh, the story about the man behind the um, the interesting Twitter moniker um, and uh, his views on Bitcoin, crypto, and uh, and the markets. Um, we have got Monsieur Mahmoudov. Monsieur, welcome. Thank you for inviting me, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. No, look, um, we are really grateful to to have you on, and we're looking forward to this session. Um, and just before we uh, we kick off, for those of you that don't know, um, Monsieur is um, is the second uh, of the uh, the family that we've had on uh, recently. We had Murad on a few weeks back. Um, how do you and Murad uh, work? Do you guys work together and just bounce ideas off each other, um, or have you gone your your own separate ways and uh, come to the similar conclusions yourselves? What the kind of relationship between you guys i mean he has he has definitely been uh into this whole space into bitcoin into crypto for longer than i have been and given the fact that he's my brother it was impossible to not know about what's going on because we spend a lot of time together and uh but yeah no we we do we do talk a lot and he obviously we uh, discuss uh, topics, news, ideas, and it's it's very it's very friendly. <laughs> nice. Do you disagree at all, or do you do you kind of come to the same conclusions? Because if it was my brother, we would probably be fighting. Uh, but um, yeah, how, do, you, do you guys think this in a similar way? Um, most of the time, yeah. Maybe sometimes it's we when it comes to some details, but they're not very important. So most of the time, we we, we tend to agree. Nice. Well, between myself and Stig, we just have each other to uh, to talk about the crazy world of, of crypto and Bitcoin about everybody else in our lives think that we are completely uh, off our off our rockers um, with this stuff. But uh, we uh, stand. For... We all know otherwise, don't we? We do. Uh, yeah, no, it's totally normal. Don't don't expect anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But... So. So look, thank you for coming on. Um, if you could just give uh, just a bit more of background to, to who you are uh, and what you're uh, currently doing um, and uh, and what's going on in your life at the moment, um, it would be uh, be great for uh, for listeners to hear that. And then we'll start to go into your article that's recently been published about Bitcoin. Sounds great. So uh, my name is Monsieur, and uh, I am currently studying economics at Columbia University, and uh, I've been in this space for maybe a year and a half and what really brought me here is probably the fact that before being really into bitcoin and uh cryptocurrencies uh is the fact that i was building startups i i was really into building different apps for ios android in the past i'm not i'm not a coder but i i do a lot of ui and ux design and uh so I was really into that. And what I came to realize eventually was the fact that a lot of these tech giants like Facebook are central are, are essentially centralized choke points. They are basically monopolies that often use their position to keep any other entrepreneurs, any other small companies away. And it's often that you need to depend on these platforms for like APIs and stuff like that. And you are at any day you are vulnerable to being simply cut off and your access to their platform is absolutely limited, which is critical to, to the running of your application. And I have personally faced some of those 
issues. And at around the same time, Murad was already very much into Bitcoin. And so I, I couldn't help but uh, notice what was going on. And this idea of decentralization really appealed to me because I had experience. I have I had I've had experience in this dynamic where these centralized monopolies they basically take take away your power and you are you you can't do anything in in the face of that. So yeah, that's how I got into the space. Awesome. And you said you were at Columbia University. Um, what's the what, what's it like though being an economics student and having I guess I'm assuming here as well. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, having quite firm and strong views about um, you know, time preference, Austrian economics, the hardness of money, um, and, and this belief that, that this is in how strong Bitcoin is um, and, and how important it is for the world, when what seems to me the case is that in a lot of the, the universities around the world, the economic discourse predominantly um, follows Keynesian theory and, and that of inflationary um, and easy money policies. What are your? Do you, do you have any conflicts with the professors there, or, or any of the teachings? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question because I think that's very relevant in the time that we live in today. And like, you would think that you, you, if you go to like a university in the states, that you would get like a very broad overview of different types of economic schools. But no, you don't. It's it's like all very much taken for granted. Nobody even, no, nobody even questions uh the like the status quo and keynesian economics are the norm and like sometimes i do i do just like to just ask random questions that are that relate to austrian economics but i always get some kind of like from the professors i get some kind of like uh answers which are very very vague and just try to move away from the topic and that's yeah that, that, that has been my experience it's very unfortunate but i guess the economic reality imposes itself onto the world so <laughs> it doesn't really matter <laughs> so it's, the like, end of the day. it's like it directs the learning in that sense yeah for sure so to be honest like a lot of the learning of the austrian economics most of it has been done on my own on the internet or reading different books mises hayek whatnot yeah yeah, yeah. which is actually not easy because i've I, you know i've gone down that rabbit hole myself over the last um sort of 18 months and i'm currently about 200 pages into human action from by Mises and um, and it's it's heavy heavy going it's it's really hard work so without sort of having that um, academic institution surrounding you and, and coaching you through it it's um, it is quite heavy reading but um, but really valuable so okay um, fantastic thank you for that one of the things that uh, I know we're really really keen to talk on to uh, talk about and which we'd like to really get into is that you've uh, just f published an article and it'd be great to it'd be great to first of all get a bit of context around that so uh why you've written it uh how it's come about and kind of the overall structure of that yeah uh no that, that's, that's a good question and i think that so the article is it's a series of articles it, it will exist in three parts and the first part we published it yesterday and the series is called um bitcoin winner takes most or winner takes all so that is basically like the question that we are uh, asking in the in, in, trying to tackle in this uh, series, and I think it's it's very uh, relevant because basically what we're trying to do is we're exploring the market share capture within the cryptocurrency space, and I think it's very relevant to anyone who is interested in Bitcoin, interested in other cryptocurrencies perhaps, because they are always trying to kind of see what the landscape is going to look like when everything is said and done when we actually reach equilibrium. Because right now it's still very really early stage, as we all know, and we're, we're far away from that point. But eventually, I don't know how long it's going to take, 20, 30, 50 years, perhaps, but eventually the landscape is going to look very, very different. And I definitely don't think that we're going to have the 2,000 different coins that we have today. And mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important, something to, important to think about and everyone wants to be able to imagine that future but here we try to just lay out all the different facts and different theories that um, could really define that future it, it, so something you just pick up on there is is you talk about how it's going to be the landscape in sort of 20 30 40 years time um how it's so to be slightly challenging about that how can you be so certain kind of what do you see 
in the current world at the moment that makes you that makes you think that way? Yeah. So as we already said, as we already touched on Keynesian economics and the impact it has had on the world in the last century, it's very interesting to see how uh, back in the day when we had the gold standard. The money was very different from what it is today. Uh, the money was sound, basically meaning that uh, the money, it basically, its supply was uh, capped at a, at a certain level. So the gold standard was uh, basically a system, a monetary system, uh, where every country uh, had the same amount of money as they had uh, gold in their reserves. So they couldn't simply just increase the supply of their currency at their at their will at any time. If mm. if they wanted to, they would have to increase the amount of gold that they had, and that basically uh, is the reason why we had uh, sound money. And today, the the world has changed in in the twentieth century, as throughout the century, uh, different countries and governments moved away from the gold standard for various reasons and in, as we know in 1971 it was Richard Nixon who uh, finally abandoned the gold standard by uh, by no longer ma having the dollar be redeemable uh, for gold mm -hmm. and that, that like for somebody for just the, for the layman for an average Joe it's very hard to understand the implications of this and that's why that's why I'm always concerned with the fact that Bitcoin is so interdisciplinary uh, that you need to read a, a, lar a large number of books in different categories, like in economics, in politics, and stuff like that, in order to really be able to appreciate and understand the value proposition uh, that it provides. And the fact that this is pretty much the first time in human history when where we actually have truly sound money because its supply is truly capped at 21 million. Like, for example, with gold, um, it's um, Seyfedin uh, Amos, who mm. was your previous guest, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a great Bitcoin economist and a friend who outlines this in his book, The Bitcoin Standard, which is, uh, is an absolute must read for anyone interested in this topic. He outlines how uh, the gold, gold had throughout history and even today, it has the highest stock to flow ratio, which basically means that the amount of gold that is produced every year relative to the existing uh, stock is the lowest. So it increases its supply by around 2%. And that is as, as good as it gets. Nothing else gets close. Like the second thing that, that has gotten close was silver. And, and it's at 20%, which you see the huge difference. And that's why throughout history, people have held their money in gold. But the interesting thing with Bitcoin is that soon, uh, eventually, its stock to flow ratio is going to be even higher than that of gold because it's currently like a disinflationary currency and eventually it'll be a deflationary when all of the uh, all of the bitcoins are going to be mined mm -hmm. and that really changes uh, changes the whole uh, the whole conception of money because now money is not something that is subject to uh, the will of the of those who set the monetary policy now money is just something that is there and it can preserve its uh, value into the future without any of these uh, uncertainties without any of these human uh, without this human aspect that is always present in the modern day mm -hmm. okay so if so in your article then um, we had a had a, a read through that before we set off uh, on this uh, on this journey t um, this afternoon how does it all start um, because you know I think what some people don't really understand, and actually when I was uh, getting into um, into the crypto space myself, I hadn't really asked the deep and, and interesting question of what money actually is. I'd just taken it for uh, for granted that, you know, um, paper money and uh, and then the digitization of that and, and being able to use PayPal was, was you know, the, the <laughs> best that humankind has got to offer. And obviously because we've uh, developed over thousands of years. Um, so, you know, if we go back to the beginning and, and, and sort of... Uh, start with the barter economy then um how does it all pro progress from there and land on those topics that you just started to talk about with with gold standard and the hardness of yeah. money and uh, and that so what are your views absolutely yeah that's very very important I, I think that the question of what is money is very much neglected in the modern day and it's it has kind of become like almost like a joke like 
just some kind of cliche, what is money, nobody even cares, but nobody knows the answer to it because people, they just don't, they just, for one reason or another, they they don't have the time to delve deep into monetary history and un actually understand, but it's something very important. And I think understanding monetary history is is a prerequisite to be able to appreciate Bitcoin and its value proposition. And everyone should definitely take a deeper uh, dive into uh, evolution of money and monetary history. So in our article, we do, uh, that's basically in part one, we really outline uh, uh, how money has evolved throughout time from the very beginnings of barter up until today where we have Bitcoin. And um, it's, it's very important to shed light on this topic. So before people used money for trade and exchange, barter, as you've already mentioned, was a common means of direct exchange. And what people would do, they, they would simply exchange, let's say, a good A for a good B. And it is pretty clear how this practice has a plethora of limitations because it's likely that the good that you have is not the is not something that the other person wants. So you have to go out of your way and find something that the person wants, and only then you're able to exchange with them. And this problem is also known as the problem of coincidence of wants. It, it makes barter highly impractical. And in addition to co problem of coincidence of wants, there's problem of coincidence of scales, where it is likely that your good cannot be divided and is not equal in uh, in value and in amount to the good of the other person. So it's it also makes it very, very impractical because it's not always possible to divide goods into equal parts. And then there's also the problem of coincidence of frames, of time frames, uh, which is the idea that something that you have might not actually last for that long. Let's say you're, you are, I don't know, a farmer or you plant trees and you, you grow grow apples, let's say. The fact that your apples are perishable makes it very difficult for you to be able to acquire something like a house. For example, you have you you have uh, you have you've grown hundred thousand apples and you want to trade it for a house, but chances are that the person doesn't want to accept your hundred apples because they're going to rot in in a couple of days and he's not going to be able to store it into the future. And so naturally, what happened is that people really converged to using and intermediary good for indirect exchange rather than direct exchange, which has so many different uh, problems that we just outlined. Mm -hmm. So with indirect exchange, people would use an intermediary good and it would act as a medium of exchange and would eventually replace barter. And this indirect exchange solves all these issues of coincidence of wants, times and, and scales, because the good that is chosen to fulfill this role is basically prioritized to be durable, to be divisible, to be portable, and most importantly, to be scarce. These are just some of the uh, characteristics that define money, which uh, we can get into uh, a bit later. And so throughout history and in different regions, people use different things as money. So as long as something was, for example, scarce on in some specific region and it, it, it was divisible, durable, blah, 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 they, they would eventually use that as, uh, as their money. Examples include seashells, glass beads, stuff like that. Uh, but eventually, as the world became more global, with the advent of modern technology and better transportation, the limitations of these monies started to show. And this is how it happened. So on some island, for example, seashells were used as money because seashells satisfied the aff aforementioned characteristics. And most importantly, seashells were scarce on that specific island. So the quantity... Uh, of the seashells was limited. But as uh, as we progress into the future, travel and uh, transportation became more common and Europeans often visited, came and uh, visited uh, these islands. And what they would do is that they would clearly want to uh, conduct trade with the, with, the, with the locals. But Europeans were, for example, already using silver or gold or whatever. But these islanders, they, they weren't. They were using seashells, for example. And they wouldn't accept anything but seashells. They would be like, no, I'm not selling you my food. I'm only because you are not giving me seashells. Mm -hmm. And what the Europeans realized, because they already had better technology, better uh, transport routes and systems, they realized that they could basically use their technology in order to bring more, a very large amount of that specific region, region specific money, let's say seashells, to that island and be able to buy up anything they want. 
which is essentially what happened because what they did w- was uh, they usually imported uh, things like seashells from other places in the world to this island where seashells were limited in supply and they were basically able to increase the supply of money thereby taking away uh, most of the value for themselves. Okay, and, so once, so, so, so once yeah. you, you undermine the scarcity of, of a good or a commodity that's being used as money, the value of that money then decreases because of inflationary um, actions, I guess. Yeah, the supply, absolutely. The supply so, is increasing, therefore it's not retaining its value, which which yeah, is effectively because, what happens with with the fiat currencies we have today, right? Yeah, because your when the supply is increased, your portion, your share of the money supply becomes smaller, so clearly it, it becomes less. Uh, it's worth it's worthless. Yeah, and uh, as this uh, this dynamic progressed, eventually through this process of almost natural selection, uh, most of the world converged to using gold as money, and that has been the standard for a, lo- a long time. Because why? Because gold as I already said, has the highest stock-to-flow ratio, meaning that its supply is the most difficult to increase relative to the existing stock. And gold basically preserved its value better than anything else. So people realize that I'd rather hold my uh, wealth in something that preserves its value into the future rather than something that will be worth less tomorrow. And uh, the, the whole point is that with gold, there wasn't any one country, one leader, one entity that could easily come and just increase the supply because increasing supply of gold is very costly and it requires mining it. So people could really trust to that system much more than seashells, which proved to be a lot less scarce and have had much lower stock to flow ratio. Um, and what's also interesting is the fact that uh, a lot of people, they're kind of uh, always asking, but what about silver? How does, wh- why was there silver if gold is so good? And it's true. It wasn't just gold that was used for a long time in, in history, but it was also silver and even copper sometimes. They proved useful in trade. And it seems strange because gold clearly fulfills those properties of money much better than silver or copper. As I said, it has higher uh, stock to flow ratio. But the answer is simple. It's because the value per unit of weight of gold was very high and measuring and dividing it into smaller, in fact, tiny pieces was for daily exchanges was very impractical. So instead, people just used, used silver or copper, which was much easier to, it was easier to just create coins, which were like, you know, which actually looked like coins, not something that would be super <laughs> small uh, that would have to be used in, uh, uh, with gold. And this this is, is known, known as a bimetallic standard, where whereby both gold and silver were used worldwide. It was it was just a temporary phenomenon because of the lack of technology. And uh, what comes afterwards is actually really important. And I think we we try to outline very art, we try to do it articulately and succinctly in, but that's almost impossible in our article. It's the paper money, the the advent of paper money, and how that totally changed. Uh, this system. So as just just before money, we yeah. um, so just before we move on to paper money and and the fiat yeah, system, sure. just one question I had. One thing that always, if you if you try and talk to anybody um, that perhaps isn't an economist and doesn't understand these concepts um, about the importance of gold and the historical importance of it, um, one answer that quite often comes back to you is. Um, yeah, gold was used um, at a point in time um, in history, but it can also be used for other things like um, electronic component manufacturing, like jewellery. So it has an intrinsic value. Um, is that a sort of misnomer? Is that just coincidental that it can be um, used as jewellery and it's a, it's a precious metal, so it has other uses? Um, is that coincidental to the fact that, um, or, or less important rather, than um, the, the thing that was recognised very early on um, by humanity was that this is this is a scarce resource it's very difficult to mine therefore the value of it remains high it's just that we found other uses for it as well and it's perhaps a display uh, of wealth a public display of wealth that using it in jewelry i definitely agree more with the latter part of what you said because uh, any money has to first undergo the process of monetization which is uh, a process where first it is basically a collectible could be a form like jewelry or something that people wear. Uh, then it becomes, as people start to value it, 
it's it's then becomes a store of value that is able to preserve its uh, value into the future. And then as as once it has become a store of value, then people are more uh, incentivized to use it as a, as a medium of exchange. And only then it becomes the unit of account. So yeah, uh, people in the Bitcoin space always talk about this process of monetization. But with regards to gold being used in uh, other uh, in the industry, that that's not what gives its value. The the monetary premium is uh, is basically if it wasn't for the fact that gold is used as money, the fact that it's used in the industry would make it worth very little, maybe ten times less, or I don't know, maybe it would only be like five percent. No, definitely not. It wouldn't be what it's worth today. It's that monetary premium. It's the fact that everyone values it as money because it is able to store its value into the future once again because it has such a high stock to the high uh, such a high to uh, stock to flow ratio so it's not because it is used in the industry that's for sure because silver is used in industry much more than uh, than gold but it's uh w- once so right now uh, like i right now i was about to get into paper money and how paper money basically uh once paper money was used and popularized silver was no longer needed because now paper money could be used and it could be backed by gold so that uh, any kind of quantity uh, of value could be represented because it was representing the underlying gold. You, didn't, you no longer needed to divide gold into tiny particles. So once that happened, now we basically have silver uh, that is serving the purpose of being used in uh, whatever jewelry or in the industries. And we see how much, uh, what is the mar- total market cap of silver today? It's much, much less than it was um, in the past, back when we didn't have paper money. And can I, yeah. Sorry, can I, can I ask a really stupid question, which may be a really stupid question? Um, there are no stupid questions. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. That's, you haven't heard a question from Stig. Come on. Yeah, I do, <laughs> I do ask some very stupid questions. Um, and I don't, I don't know why I've never asked this before, but why it does, does diamond as a material surely not have a lower stock to flow ratio than gold, for instance? It's or, are there, no. or are there, are there not other like gems or materials that could be used for monetary purposes, which aren't? So, uh, this, this is important. This is important to, it's important, important question to go over because gold is actually one of the most, it's like top three or yeah, top four most, uh, least abundant uh, elements in earth cr- in the earth's crust to exist in this world mm. and even though there are like two or three different ones I, I can't remember which ones they are but even though they're more scarce technically their stock to flow ratio is not as high because gold has been uh, mined for thousands and thousands of years so mm. we have such large stockpiles of gold that even if today someone finds more gold and they dig it out and they mine it it's going to be like a drop into the ocean of the gold that has already been mined before and is the stockpiles that already exist today so that is a very important thing even though there technically could be some element that is more scarce in the earth in the crust mm-hmm. that doesn't make it more it doesn't make it have a higher stock to flow ratio what is which, which is the most important thing when it comes to money mm-hmm. yeah gotcha okay helpful uh, yeah, so, so you, you were starting as, to talk about fiat. Um, yeah, paper money, because it's very, very important to understand how it really changed this landscape. So once uh, paper money was introduced and popularized, people started using paper money backed by gold. And this paper money could represent any amount of underlying gold. So it no longer suffered from this impracticability of dividing gold into smaller units, as I would have said. And interestingly, the value of silver, silver relative to gold plummeted because of this. And we, we have a very cool graph in our article, in the part one, that depicts the gold to silver ratio. And you see how it reacted when paper money began, began to be used worldwide. It just, it, just, it, uh, it just skyrockets because now silver is not worth, it, it lost its monetary premium because now everyone is using paper money. And then, yeah, uh, however, because a lot of people simply used paper money, these receipts, and the gold that was backing it, the underlying gold, was sitting in vaults of goldsmiths. What goldsmiths realized was the fact that they could be making more money by loaning out the money in excess of the gold reserves that they had in the vaults. And this became known as the fractional reserve banking that is every, that everyone talks about today. And the problem with that is that 
if all the people who had the paper money or the IOUs or the receipts that represented the gold, if they were to come to the goldsmiths and to redeem their gold, that would basically be a run on a bank. And essentially, the goldsmiths would not have enough gold that because they loaned out more money receipts. They loaned out receipts in excess of the gold reserves. And that would create just the, the situation of default. So that, that, that is very problematic with... Uh, with uh, in the modern in the modern system, because we have this and with gold essentially, because this problem is called uh, it's one of the perhaps the greatest disadvantages of gold. Uh, it's the idea of centralization in vaults problem. When most of the gold sits in a vault of a bank or goldsmith or wherever, then it is very easy for some authority for some government to basically take control of it, and that's essentially what happened, and that allowed because. A lot of the uh, gold back in the day, when let's say in 1971, when uh, Nixon uh, abandoned the gold standard, it was in the it was at the Fed, and uh, they no longer wanted to give it away, redeem it for the dollars that people had, and yeah, uh, that's that's what happened. That's why gold didn't fail, but it 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 was no longer uh, available for the use that it purpose that it once uh, promised. And yeah, do, do you have any questions regarding this? Uh, because I, I have more stuff re yeah, regarding I mean, the topic. Just that that specific um, period in time is is one that that I think is quite interesting. It's quite complex that not many people also understand. I think that period from uh, from World War One um, through to um, Bretton Woods and uh, and Nixon uh, and 1971 would be a really interesting um, time period just to explore in a bit more detail if you're able to do that. Yeah, for sure. But I think it's also important to see what was happening during the gold standard and mm. where was that first point where it started to, to the country started kind of moving away from it. Mm -hmm. And as we already said, the uh, gold standard was basically a monetary system where a uh, country's monetary supply was directly linked to the amount of gold reserves that they had. And it essentially capped the nation's ability to increase the supply of their money. Mm -hmm. But during the First World War, that's, that's when countries actually started to move away from it. And uh, clearly, you need a lot of money to sponsor your war efforts and uh, whatnot. And if that, the funny thing is that most of the people didn't expect the World War One to last that long. And this is this is the, the fact that there was n the world was moving away from the gold standard is one of the reasons why the wars in the 20th century have lasted so much longer than those in the 19th century, for example. And that uh, that is i think that that's one of the one of the most striking historical uh historical facts and yeah it was um so i think it was safety in that um first introduced yeah, yeah. me to the concept i'd never heard of mm -hmm. that that sort of issue before that you know up until really up until world war one um you know the gold standard was was working fine um yeah you know, classical economists and, and keynesian economists will will point out some of the challenges of, of it over the sort of 30 years prior to that but um really it was actually serving its purpose um and it was when the the economies needed to expand their um money supply to to pay for um war efforts um that actually we entered the era of um a real expansionary policy um and it was the fact that perhaps at the end of that um world war one or world war two we didn't as a um society as the world as a whole didn't return to sound money principles because the um, inflation of the currencies was such that people would have had to realize that their their money had been devalued so in um, so extremely that uh, there would have been kind of riots and uh, an outrage. So so it wasn't uh, it wasn't addressed. Um, I think that's uh, that they're the sort of high level points that safety puts out that I, but I'd never mm -hmm. I'd never come across them before. Um, but feel free to carry on and take us through to 1971 though. Yeah, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, what happened later was uh, ever since the First World War, the gold standard was never the same. What happened was basically, uh, I think it was around 50s after World War II, was when uh, it was the United States who were given uh, the task to basically hold the world's, uh, uh, have the US dollar be redeemable for gold. So the, instead of all the central banks in the world having their own uh, large reserves of gold, they would could basically use the dollar, and then at any time they needed, they could basically redeem it at, 
uh, with the with the U.S. central bank with the Fed and get the the get the gold. But clearly, in 1971, we see that uh, Richard Nixon uh, wanted to s- sever all the ties uh, with, uh, of the dollar with the gold because it was basically problematic and uh, giving away the gold is definitely not. It's it's there's a huge trade off that when you give the gold for the dollars because the gold is definitely worth more uh, and. Yeah, that, that's how it all ended. And now today we just have money that is not backed by anything and is essentially not scarce. And it is subject to the monetary policies of different countries, which so that, changes everything. So that final step then in, in 1971, is that not effectively a default on, on loans? Because I think uh, you know, the Fed was holding gold, um, not just for, for America, but for all kinds of other uh, all countries all around the world. How did it then repay those uh, that value to those countries? Did it just print US dollars and as, as a result of Bretton Woods and US dollar being um, denominated as a or designated as a, as a reserve currency effectively say, no, here's your equivalent value in dollars? Or did it just default uh, and not pay them at all? I'm not entirely sure. I would, I would have to look into that. But I, I would definitely think that yeah, once that happens, uh, the U.S. U.S. government could be really loose with its uh, with its monetary policy and just increase the supply when needed, as needed, okay. as they do today. Okay, so that then brings us up to fiat and and where we are today. So governments effectively and central banks have full control over economic policy um, and and inflation and and, and central banking really seeks to control. Um, I'm not going to say manipulate. Some people might say manipulate, but uh, the the interest rates and uh, and the way that uh, the economy performs. Um, how does that fit into Bitcoin, and why does Bitcoin matter in that context? Then, yeah, no, that, that fits in actually very well because today we basically exist in a world where there are over 180 currencies, and the reason for such an anomaly actually. It's pretty simple, is that there is no free market for currencies. That does not exist. Currency markets have been restricted by different countries in order to maintain that financial control. And there are different institutions, laws set up for exactly that purpose that inhibits a free market monetary system. And these include enforced borders, legal tender laws, capital controls, state decrees, senior privileges, local control, uh, debt extinguishing laws, capital gains taxes, implicit bailout guarantees for banks, central banks, and a bunch of other artificial barriers. And all of these things keep us away from just having, even even if it's not purely sound, from having access to the most competitive, the most saleable currency that exists. So if it wasn't for all these things, most people would probably use one or two or whatever much smaller number than 180 for sure more competitive currencies and like do you think do you really think that venezuelans would prefer to use the venezuelan bolivar over the u.s dollar given the situation that they're undergoing right now obviously not they would they would love to use the u.s dollar but the entrance of the u.s dollars is very is is limited it's it's controlled and even the, the the u.s dollars that probably make it into Venezuela are are sold at a much higher premium, and they don't necessarily satisfy that the the demand that exists for them. And sorry, getting I was gonna into say, sorry, yeah, I was so, just going to ask. That, so can I, can I just run you by that point again? So the restrictions of dollar coming into Venezuela. So everyone in Venezuela at the moment is in demand for the dollar, but there's a restriction that the government puts in place for the amount of dollars that can enter into the Venezuelan market. And that means right. that therefore the only opportunity for people to get them is to buy them at a premium on a dollar black market. Yeah, precisely. Exactly. Awesome. And uh, this is where Bitcoin comes in because Bitcoin is often referred to as digital gold because it maintains and improves upon most of gold's properties, including scarcity, unfordable costliness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But given its digital nature, bitcoins are easily divisible, portable, unseizable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this enables it to be much better protected from the threats of centralization, all the things that we have just mentioned, and the face, the, also the fate experienced by experienced by gold, uh, and. 
contrary to the 20th century locally nationalized market for money with 180, over 180 currencies, the cryptocurrency market on the other side, on the other hand, is uh, much better resembles this competitive private market where no coercive monopolies distort the price signals by preventing competitors from entering. And also given the open source nature of cryptocurrencies, anyone is essentially free to create their own, modify existing ones, which is which is very in line with the idea of free markets. And yeah, th th this does encourage an open, inexpensive experimentation with money, which is es essential for uh, free markets and competitive competition. So would, yeah. so would Bitcoin therefore probably be the first real true form of a free market? Well, I, I don't think that it's possible to say that like a purely, truly free market ever existed or can ever exist. That's, mm. that's very perfectionist. But I think it's definitely more free than anything that came before it because because of its digital nature that is once again borderless divisible into 100 million satoshis etc etc unseizable etc and this is where we kind of get to the crux of the of the article and this is already i think we're already in in the second part that is not published yet but <laughs> will be published in in a couple of weeks max mm -hmm. uh, but it's coming we're, we're still working on it but uh, the idea is the fact that assuming operation under this free market, the question then becomes is to what extent the natural money uh, capture, uh, captures uh, market, mar the market share. Like while today's world has manifested itself differently uh, with like 180 currencies, we had a glimpse of this winner take most, if not all, reality with gold, right? And assuming a long-term horizon, this same glimpse of reality may play out with cryptocurrencies, but this time it wouldn't. It wouldn't be just mm -hmm. a, a temporary thing. It would be something that would, I would think, would last for much longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a just before we start diving into a bit of part two and part three, which would be great to cover off, even just a yeah. couple of bits of it. Yeah, there's of a, there's a really really there's a really interesting closing point that you make in part one for me, which is around um, the reference to Hayek's quote around the only way out of the world that we've kind of got into is to find a, I think the quote's a sly roundabout way of introducing something that they can't stop. One of the, one of the sorts of questions I had when I was reading that is, uh, is Bitcoin the first or is, um, yeah, is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency the first attempt at this? Have there been other attempts? Uh, if there have been, have they failed? And why has, why have we got to this situation where this potentially has succeeded, where that sly roundabout has been found? Yes, uh, that's, that's a great question. So there have been um, previous attempts at doing something like this. And uh, I can't remember the exact names of the people, but there were projects before. But the problem is that all of these projects, they, uh, they were made up of different parts that make up Bitcoin today, but not all of them. So one of them would, would use something that Bitcoin uses today. The other one would use something else, but none of them had this whole this comprehensive system that bitcoin is uh today and all of those they would they they basically had limitations that bitcoin doesn't have because bitcoin was basically an improvement upon all of the all of them that allowed something to uh that allowed a form of money to work the way it does today and one of the most important problems was that in uh in the previous attempts at creating something like this there was again the problem of centralization, and because like I, I can't, I don't exactly exactly remember the the details, but the people who started these systems, it was basically like there was a single point of failure because they were centralized, and the government could basically just come to see the, whatever that company person or whatever, and just seize their assets and find them, or, I don't know, or do something even worse. So that that was the problem. But it's the it's the innovation that. Bitcoin brings all those things together. The, it's proof of work system, the perfectly aligned incentives. All these things together allow for Bitcoin to prosper in a way that is unprecedented. So we won't press you on parts two and three. We'll wait for the uh, um, for the revelation of those, um, or the we'll wait for the publication of those um, 
over the next few weeks. Um, but effectively, part two, you're saying, covers the notion that winner takes all or winner takes most, is, is um, and that's the, the discussion point in, in your second article. Third article is around the technological and borderless nature of, of crypto as a bedrock for a true free market activity. I would actually say that the, the third part is more about how um, that winner, who whether they take most or take all, uh, whether that winner is going to be able to basically carve into a substantial share of the global money market. Because like, even if we have the winner take all, but if that market cap is just 100 billion, that's not that much compared to all mm -hmm. the global market for okay. money. But even if it's a winner take most and the whole market cap is, let's say, in the trillions, then that, that totally changes the game. Okay. So yeah. So the main things that I wanted to actually press in on was uh, was threats and challenges, because you know these ideas and and this as as Hayek said the the sly roundabout way that um, Bitcoin could perhaps replace uh, government money. It's for it, for Bitcoin to do that, it may well be possible. Um, however, it's going to face massive challenges, certainly in adoption, in regulation, um, not just adoption from individuals, but from um, institutions and governments. And also, as we talked about at the very beginning, academic discourse, um, you know, Austrian economics and uh, all of the key principles that underpin a lot of the ideology of Bitcoin. They just aren't really taught that much, um, even though they, they exist. But um, so how how do you think that is going to play out for Bitcoin and, and how perhaps can it address those things? Is it just a, a question of um, time and, and letting time um, take its course and Bitcoin prove its worth as um, perhaps the US dollar starts to fall, maybe the euro encounters challenges and, and nation states, um, more established nation states like the US, uh, or also not more established, but better uh, governed uh, states like the US or other countries around the world start to experience um, hyperinflation. What do you, how, how does Bitcoin yeah, no, get through those that's barriers? A, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think it's important to... Uh, touch on a couple of points here. The first one being the fact that I don't actually think that the idea of hyper-Bitcoinization, it's not something that happens overnight. It's mm -hmm. not something that just, we're, just we're going to wake up and everyone is just using Bitcoin. That's, that's probably not how it's going to happen. It's going to take years, but it's going to be a gradual, a steady process that has already, I think that has already started and we are uh, envisioning it and seeing it every single day. Uh, so, yeah, like, for example, when with the advent on the, of the internet, like, you know, the televisions still exist today, people still watch TV, but less and less. So it's like, it's a, it's a gradual thing. Uh, it's not something that just happens and everyone just moves on. But nevertheless, internet has had an, a huge impact. Probably more people, uh, probably just as, much, as many people watch uh, shows or YouTube or Netflix as they do TVs. Which, which is incredible to think about. And I think something like that is probably more likely to happen with Bitcoin rather than it being like some, some destructive um, overnight event, which, yeah. And another, another point is, uh, I'm actually writing another article uh, right now. It's shorter than this one. It's not <laughs> going to have three parts. <laughs> it's just going to have one. And it's about the Bitcoin incentive system. So how, how Bitcoin's incentives are perfectly aligned in a way that allow for its growth. Uh, and <clears throat> the, the most interesting thing is just, except for the Bitcoin incentives that exist within the system, within the Bitcoin community itself, there are like outside factors, outside incentives that kind of propel Bitcoin further. And like, given the fact that Bitcoin is a neutral, apolitical, money that is not affiliated with any particular country, person, or anything. Institutions and various authorities worldwide, I think, are in the long run kind of disincentivized from banning or restricting Bitcoin use and its mm -hmm. development very aggressively, like as you, as you mentioned. Because given that Bitcoin is designed to exist and actually thrive in an adversarial environment, a particular country, say the United States, stands to lose a lot, a lot, and maybe even more, it stands to lose more by banning Bitcoin than, than, than not doing it. Because developers, users, companies working and using Bitcoin, and what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is, it's, it's an industry now. It's, it's at the forefront of technological and economic innovation. 
and all of that would be lost. All of these people would relocate to a different country with a more accommodating jurisdiction and mm -hmm. better, uh, more welcoming region, yeah. basically. And given the tense relations and the international ri rivalry that exists among the world superpowers, I don't know, US, China, Russia, whatever, it is practically impossible to imagine all of these countries cooperating together to dismantle Bitcoin. Like that, that has never happened in the history of the world for all these countries to work together to fight some common cause. That's just that's just not happening. I don't think so. And also the fact that the US dollar has been the world's reserve currency for the last 50 years, essentially, it, it gives you in the United States a huge and unfair advantage over other countries that depend on US monetary policy. because. The, U, the, the U.S. dollar makes up over 63% of the foreign exchange reserves, and that basically says how much power <laughs> that country has because of, uh, because of their currency. And the interesting thing is that many governments and countries stand to gain from Bitcoin's adoption, as that would remove world's dependence on the U.S. dollar and provide them with a feasible alternative. And in today's world, we see that like with all the U.S. sanctions and, and things like that, that the, there is there is a huge place for su for for such an alternative, and it's there is demand for that. So there's a really interesting quote um, that I uh, read about Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm actually I had it right in front of me, one that I'd made before. It's just like an episode of Blue Peter. This, but um, I'm going to read it out now because I think it is <laughs> worth reading out. And I think from what you just said about incentives um, and and the validity of, of Bitcoin, I think it's really um, interesting. So it's from Ralph Merkel, who is for those that don't know, is a crypto cryptography expert um, and the founder of the Merkle tree, which is a key part of the, the Bitcoin software. Um, but what, what he says is, Bitcoin is the first example of a new form of life. It lives and breathes on the internet. It lives because it can pay people to keep it alive. It lives because it performs a useful service that people will pay it to perform. It lives because anyone anywhere can run a copy of its code. It lives because all the running copies are constantly talking to each other. It lives because if any one copy is corrupted, it's discarded quickly and without any fuss or muss. It lives because it's radically transparent. Anyone can see its code and see exactly what it does. I think for me, that's a really powerful uh, phrase because, you know, if Bitcoin was, as you said, ever banned or and all countries in the world worked together to stop it, you, it would still, it would just simply come back to life at the point at which um, everybody turned back on their mining rigs, and it would continue to exist. It couldn't be really truly stopped, as far as I'm aware. Can I yeah. can I can I wade in and sort of challenge this little love in, <laughs> um, which I which I'm all part of, but I just want to be I want to be the the. Devil's advocate. The devil's advocate in the room. So, so I completely get and understand that we went from a gold standard and decoupled away from that and printed a load of money to fund basically war and industrial change over the course of the last hundred years. And we've now got to a point where we've printed so much money that the balance sheets that we have across the globe are starting to waver too much into the debt versus growth. If people see Bitcoin as the kind of the future vehicle for supporting our future growth as uh, uh, species, then how do how will it not end up in the same position that gold has, where actually the finite supply is an issue? Um, where how do we continue growing once we've got to that point where we've hit that that ceiling with Bitcoin? I know we're looking Mars in the future, and we probably can't predict it, but it's something that I'm really trying to grapple with at the moment. So uh, I th what I think that you were kind of like alluding to is the idea of like inflationary versus deflationary world where the money doesn't doesn't the, where the supply is not increased, but actually it is either kept constant and or or decreased if people lose their priorities um, and how that how will that accommodate the the growing world economy? I think the most important thing here to understand is the fact that the quantity of money doesn't matter as long as it is uh, as long as it is uh, stable the, the the quantity as long as it's not increased in a way that is so unpredictable like it is today as long as we know that there is this amount and this is how it's going to be or even if there or even if it's like at least predictable like we know how much it will the how much by how much it will increase which is still not the world that we live in today yeah the uh the target the u.s target is always two percent but it's, it's never the case it's probably more like 
over five. <laughs> and that, that is the most important thing, like over 5%. And like, if you, if you use compound interest, like 15 years, and that's like almost 50% or something like around, around 50%. Which is, which is crazy to think about. So yeah, so it doesn't matter how much money there is, as long as the money is divisible and it is, its supply is constant, then, it's the, then any, any size, any increase in the economy can be accommodated. But the problem is that like, one of the reasons why uh, increasing supply is so, has such a allure to <laughs> countries is probably the fact that when there is deflation, that means that the prices are going down. And when the prices are going down, that means that the salaries and the paychecks have to adjust and they also have to go down. But it's very unpopular with the people when, when, they're, uh, when their paychecks are going down, even though it could be that because the prices are going down, they're actually getting, they're, they're becoming more wealthy. Because like, once again, the absolute, the number of, of, of money, the amount, the, 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 the number doesn't matter as long as it's stable. Because your uh, paycheck could decrease, but you could your purchasing power could increase if the prices decrease. If, if the prices decrease more, mm -hmm. so they just like people just want to live in this illusion of higher paychecks. Oh, I got a twenty percent raise. Oh, wait, the inflation rate is higher, so actually it doesn't. Only your purchasing power only decreased. So I guess it's, it's psychological in that sense, you know. Yeah. But, so you, uh, that's an that's an interesting point because what you're basically talking about is people view growth as anything growth based as being positive but whether that's yeah. good growth or not it's kind of slightly immaterial exactly and that's exactly. something we've discussed previously actually you know the, the the misunderstanding or the the sleight of hand of um fiat currency and and effectively enriching um either governments or giving them the ability to spend money um, on vanity projects or, or capital infrastructure programs that aren't really well thought out and um and also to to then distribute to the people at the top of the chain and uh, people in institutions who typically benefit and don't pass those um, uh, that that currency downstream to other businesses uh, through loans, mortgages. They you know they hang on to it themselves, benefit, and uh, and it's the people at the bottom, the end of the chain, that that actually lose out there um, because the money's transferring into the government's so, pocket whilst their savings are devalued. Yeah, just yeah. Sure. Sorry for interrupting. I think it's very important to understand how uh, humanity progresses and how we accumulate, uh, how we basically advance technologically and economically. It's not by increasing the supply, it's actually by uh, increasing, what, what, what increasing supply does is basically, it makes you more likely to go spend your money because you know that tomorrow it's not gonna be worth as much, so I'd rather spend it today because tomorrow I won't be able to buy anything. Uh, and instead that makes you spend instead of save. But saving, is at the heart of uh, global prosperity. It's at the heart of technological progress and advancement. Because once you save, that means that you are accumulating capital. Once you accumulate capital, that means that you have the time to sit down and to think, and to think, what should I invest in? What should I, I sh uh, what should I invest in into long term? Because now I have the time to. My my money is not losing its value. Now I can just sit on it and think. What, maybe I should invest in some business, maybe I should invest in some startup, something promising, something that is going to give jobs, something, something that's going to increase the GDP, et cetera, et cetera. Not, some, not just like buying, I don't know, McDonald's and shoes tonight, you know, which is not doing really anything. So once you're able to collect that uh, capital and accumulate it, you're able to uh, invest it into longer term things. And that's what Safety always talks about, how your uh, time preference lowers as a result. And... What low time preference means that you are valuing uh, your future uh, over the present. You're, it's like that marshmallow experiment where, where they basically concluded that uh, a child who is likely, who, who uh, if you give children a choice of either consuming one marshmallow right now or two marshmallow in 15 minutes, those children who chose to consume two marshmallow in 15 minutes on average had like a higher SAT score in their future and did much better in life. I, I don't know if that was, I don't know if it was actually, I don't know, proven later, but that makes total sense. Like you can't, you can't, you can't consume right now and expect tomorrow, tomorrow to have that money to be able to buy something much, which is more, worth more than, but we live in this world where people are very much focused on um, 
immediate gratification, instant gratification, and just like consuming right now. Inst everything is instant. Everything is right here at demand, on demand. Um, but yeah, but I think that the, 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 the monitoring policy is definitely making that worse. Because if money uh, ha stored its value into the future, people would be much more likely to save because they know that tomorrow they'll be able to buy more and more and more, you know? So, uh, uh, sorry, a question that was springing to mind is that, so I re to kind of recap a lot of the conversation that we've just had, does the nature of Bitcoin and the level of decentralization that's amongst it actually mean that at some point it's going to become a far more stable asset class than anything else that we currently have access to, even our own individual countries' currencies. Because we all know that they're, even though they look stable on the outside, they're not stable internally. They're always deflating. So yeah. it does, it, is there not going to become an, a point where the network is so distributed that actually it becomes a point of natural equilibrium, which means it will be a far greater stable value, which is probably the most important thing? Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of people say like, oh, wait, but how is Bitcoin money? How can I ever use it if it's so volatile, if it loses 10% a day or it can, or like lost 80% of its value in, a, in less than a year? But these people don't understand that thing that I talked about previously, the, the process of monetization. Before uh, something becomes a medium of exchange, something that you can use in your daily life that is relatively stable as we are used to, before that happens, you, it first has to establish itself as a store of value. And that is what's, what Bitcoin is doing right now. And because that is the, the step at which we are right now in this process, there, there exists disincentives to spend Bitcoin. So mm. like, why, why the hell would you want to spend your Bitcoins right now if you, if you are convinced that in 10 years they're going to be worth much more? So clearly you don't want to spend them. But when in, in 10 years, once you made like a nice return, whatever it is, you will be like, oh, okay, now I've made this return. And now Bitcoin is much larger than it was 10 years ago. And chances are Bitcoin is going to grow, but it's not going to grow. It's not going to have as much more space to grow as it, as it used to back 10 years ago, you know, because there was more time, more, more space, more room to grow for growth. And now you're more likely to spend it. And once it becomes a very large, very stable store of value, that's when people's disincentives to spend it kind of become weaker and weaker, and they're more likely to spend it in their everyday life. And that's when it becomes less volatile. And that's when you can use it as a medium of exchange. So that's the idea. Yep. Yep. I wouldn't spend something that I think is uh, is going to go up 100 to 1,000 times in value. So it um, makes <laughs> I love those. I love those moments where both you and I pause when you know you've just got to the end of something really important. You're like, just let it soak oh. in. I think I feel like we need a sort of cigarette. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't even smoke, but if, I think I need to take up smoking <laughs> just to process this this conversation. But um, perfect. So um, look, I think uh, we're kind of uh, approaching the end of our questions um, for now. Um, I think one of the things that I'd be just interested to get your final views on um, just would be um, distributed ledger technology in general. Um, you know, we talked specifically about Bitcoin. Um, if you assume um, other projects out there aren't competing with Bitcoin or trying to compete as, as a currency, but actually what they're doing is, is use, deploying smart contracts um, and using the, uh, the underlying blockchain DLT technology um, to, to perhaps to introduce distributed systems, uh, decentralized organizations. Do you think um, that can happen uh, in conjunction and um, in conjunction to Bitcoin's rise? Um, because I know there's a lot of people um, in the maximalist camp that think every other altcoin is going to go to zero and that they have z absolutely no value. Um, I'm just wondering what your views are on that. Yeah, so with regards to like smart contracts and that kind of stuff, I think that all sounds really cool in theory, but in practice, you first need a monetary unit that is that has proven to be decentralized, that has proven to be uh, worthy of our time, basically, before you can start to experiment with all those things. And that's why it's, for, it's the first and foremost is to create a decentralized money like Bitcoin. And then once it has established itself, we can build different things using it. But like with like, I don't know, Ethereum or the, the, the smart contract type of projects, they have not proven to be, uh, to once again, successfully prove to be uh, 
stable stores of value. And that is, that is once again, I, I've been repeating this all night today, but mm. that is very important that to be able to uh, fulfill this role as a store of value, that is at the heart of, uh, of any, of any, of, a, of any money really. And first, you, once you do that, then I think it's worthy of uh, thinking and uh, developing other things. But I don't think that Ethereum is very much on <laughs> anywhere on track to becoming a store of value. So like, if, how can you have like all those smart contracts if the underlying monetary unit, that asset that, that is necessary for all those smart contracts to work is so volatile and is actually not a good store of value. So yeah, that's, that's my, those are my, those are my uh, Look, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Um, what are what are the next steps for you in 2019? Is it um, is it more studying Bitcoin uh, and economics? Uh, is it are you, are you jump, jumping into the fund with with Murad? What what do the next uh, few months have for you in store? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, it's definitely learning because it's impossible. No matter how that that's what I always say. Like no matter how smart you are, once you get into Bitcoin. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how smart you were before there, before then, because it's so multidisciplinary that you will. There will definitely be something that you don't. You have no idea about. So you will definitely need to do a lot more learning, studying, reading, in order to keep track, uh, and understand un- understand the whole the whole system. So there's always something to learn, and yeah, no, I, I'm I'm very keen on continuing this process and also learning more about Austrian economics because I think that that is definitely very much linked and. Um, goes hand in hand with uh, Bitcoin's value proposition. Perfect. Yeah. And thank you guys very much for inviting me. It was it was a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to coming back one day with, when Excellent. I have more articles. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you when you've got when you've got um, part two and part three drafted, we may have to get you. Maybe we'll get you and your um, your you and your brother on for a, a double team. With great pleasure. Um, uh, what, just before you run, one of I just want to make sure that we uh, cover one of our time uh, our timely traditions, uh, which is so uh, you guys are together around sort of a, a grill, a barbecue, um, and you've got us along, for instance, as your guests, which would be quite nice. Um, what would what would you uh, throw on the barbecue to cook for us? Uh, I would go with the T-bone steak. I think that's my favorite. Very nice, a big sharing piece of meat. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> steaks are steaks are the predominant um, grill of choice. It's not quite the beer can chicken, uh, which uh, raised a few eyebrows. I'm with you on that, T-Bone Steak. Fantastic. <laughs> Look, uh, Monsieur, it's been great to have you. This has been Crypto and Grill. I've been Crypto Dantes. Um, we've had Stig of the Pump with us as well. Um, tune in again soon for another fantastic episode. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance.